Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden, cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the, of the tree of life. Man had plenty of knowledge. It was just the knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge to distinguish between the two um, that God didn't want man to now partake of the tree of life and live forever. At this point, God realized that he had to separate man from the garden, ultimately separating man from God's um, direct relationship. Now, God was still there, but there was a, a separation. Sin is an effect of the separation. Why art thou wrong? And why is thou countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, um, this is the, uh, the point at which um, sin is first mentioned in scripture. Cain is upset with Abel uh, because God blessed him uh, because his sacrifice was better. Um, he worshiped best. And so Cain, being um, angry, had a visit from the Lord. And God is telling um, Cain that there's no need for him to lend his power to sin because all he has to do is do well. Uh, but we know the story. We know how it ends. Cain is driven even further away from the presence of God. The implication is also that because um, Cain is now in his sin, he's driven himself away from God because he thinks that God uh, is no longer present there with him. So this is where power, our power in particular, comes into play. We lend our power to so many things. Uh, and, it, and it's real easy to lend our power to the wrong things. Um, the wrong things being violence, being sexual sins, idolatry, all of those things that go against the nature of God. Um, it requires very little effort um, because all of these things, all of these things belong to the separation. We begin blaming, blaming God for the things that happen to us. And I hear a lot of people say things like, uh, why, why do I need to be saved? Um, what did I do to God that requires God to have to save me? I ain't killed nobody, I ain't stole from nobody. Um, I haven't been uh, mean to anybody or whatever. So why do I need to be saved? Um, and these are the questions they have. And, and the truth is, it's not the actions of the person that makes them sinful. The truth is that it's the separation of people from God that creates the perfect opportunity for sinful behavior. It's similar to light versus dark. As long as we have light, we can see all the obstacles in our way. As long as the lights are on, it doesn't matter what's on the floor. If we're looking, we can step over when we need to step over. We can step to the side when we need to step to the side. We can climb over if there needs to be us climbing over, um, so on and so forth. But if it's dark, if it's if it's dark in that in that place, then um, no matter how uh, familiar we are with the territory, there's always the opportunity for us to either stump our toe, to bang our knee against something, to knock something down off of a shelf. Or because in the dark, when you can't see, when you're separated from the light, there, there comes opportunities for us to mismanage or make mistakes and do things that we wouldn't normally do. We, we mimic Cain in many of in the, the ways that we respond 
when God lets us know that he's not pleased. God was trying to explain to Cain that he was the cause. Cain was busy blaming God. And yet still God tried to give him peace. Um, he said, um, if anybody kill Cain, then I'll take vengeance for Cain. It's in these moments that we have to try our best not to be like him. Cain gave his power over to sin when he was supposed to have the rule over sin. And because along with God creating us in his likeness, um, there comes an opportunity to voluntarily give our power um, to sin as well. Um, we can give our power to whatever we will. And in the end, when we do give our power away like this, it creates a void. Uh, many of us today are walking around in a void trying to convince others that we have it all together. Uh, when in reality, um, we have that thing that tugs at our inner selves because guess what? It's experienced our power and we've experienced what it's like to surrender our power over. And that's why you have a lot of people who can't get over um, the sexual sins. Um, you have uh, a lot of people who are married um, or given to another person, and yet the thrill of having an extramarital affair drives them outside of their bedroom, and it's something that they they've become intoxicated with because they've they've loaned out their power to this thing. That power is fueled by a spirit of pride and insolence. Um, it does not matter if we're in the pulpit. It doesn't matter if we're in the pews. It doesn't matter if we're in the streets or the slums. Our pride is where we marry our power. Where the pride is supposed to be used to spur us as a conglomerate, we allow the pride to be what keeps us separated. Because many of us, we see the success as a mountaintop from which we are to yell to others to get their lives on the level that ours are. So to summarize, sin is a product of the separation from God. And that separation is fueled by our pride. And because we remain disconnected, we end up living in the sin and becoming comfortable with it. Just think about it. The time you had sex with that person and you felt bad about it, but you continued to go back because you allowed yourself to become accepting of the feeling of guilt and shame. That was that, that pride taking over because it owned our power. So much so that if anyone mentioned anything seeming to criticize the situation similar, we became defensive or angry. And we start blaming uh, the other person involved in the relationship when really it doesn't, it doesn't involve the other person. It all comes back to us. What about that lifestyle that you aspire to because of the, the clout and the acceptance? These things are accepted because of the pride that has arisen from the separation. The Messiah steps in. Uh, we call him Jesus Christ. Uh, we call him Yeshua Mashiach. Uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Um, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we're healed. Isaiah 53 um, says um, that he did not fit the stereotypical uh, idea of what the Messiah was to embody. Um, he was stricken for the transgression of the Hebrew people in order to reconnect mankind to God with access to the tree of life from the Garden of Eden. To do that, he paid the price owed for the curse of his forefathers and ours. But because he was not decked in royalty, of course, we rejected him. But why was he different? Um, and it, I don't think it's enough to just say, well, just because he was different. Uh, because that, that doesn't answer the question. Um, instead, I want to try to analyze it from a standpoint of sin or the separation from God. Um, we've established that the sin is a product of the separation and it's fueled by pride. So the Messiah 
being prophesied from times of old uh, was someone that many had looked for. Uh, but they looked for someone who was of an earthly royalty. Um, they knew that he would be charismatic. Um, they knew that he would be one that people would follow. Um, they knew that he would want to liberate um, their people, our people. Um, and they were very similar to us in that um, we look for someone to lead us who is going to have our desires um, and call for a true freedom. Um, he came in pride, but it was not the pride of self. He came proclaiming the kingdom of heaven. He didn't one time say, worship me and watch me deliver you. He said instead, follow me and the father in heaven will deliver you. So he passes the first test of pride. He did not come in his own name. He came in the name of the most high. The second test is his uh, tactic of liberation. How did he come to set the people free? Um, first, he came in healing people. And he didn't just heal Hebrew people, he healed Gentiles as well. Um, he hung out with the prostitutes. He hung out with government officials. Uh, he uh, was against the religious authority um, because they had their foots on the necks of the common folks. He allowed people to be free from sin. He didn't want the glory of fame. He only wanted to exalt the glory of his father, the almighty God. But Christ says the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Because our forefathers operated in this space of separation fueled by pride, they, as well as the church body believers today, believed that the Sabbath was a way to make men work to please God. And the reality is that the Sabbath was a day of gratitude. Not man's gratitude to God, but God's gratitude toward men. Again, this was the ultimate liberation. Christ was essentially saying the Sabbath was created because God wanted to honor man with the day of rest. And even in giving the law in the wilderness, God still made the Sabbath day a day of honor, a day for man to be honored. Because if we go back, God made the Sabbath day holy at the beginning when he created the heavens and the earth. But we want to make the Sabbath a part of, um, quote unquote, religious doctrine um, or a part of the, quote unquote, Ten Commandments. And yes, it's mentioned in the Ten Commandments, but it was given long before the Ten Commandments. But again, uh, this was an example of Christ trying to prepare the people to live in the freedom of the kingdom of God. I'm doing the things of God out of gratitude and not out of trying to earn justification. So verse 28 was a double blessing in a way. The Sabbath already belonged to man as a day of honor. And because man was to believe in Christ who fulfilled the law, that day of honor is a double portion of honor, making liberation of God through Christ even more freeing. So we're even more free when it comes to the Sabbath through Christ, meaning we can rest even more now in the Sabbath, knowing that God is honoring us. Not only did he honor us with a day of rest, but he honored us by giving us his son who fulfilled the law, who also uh, ordained that day of rest. So it's a double blessing. But thirdly, um, we have to see what Christ's mode of identifying the body was. The Messiah prophecy was one that had the kingdom of the Hebrews operating in one accord. Every Messiah, past and present, came with promises of unseating the political body. This is to be fulfilled in the end, but in the meantime, the opportunity has been extended for everybody who will accept the offer of citizenship within the kingdom of God. This essentially is salvation. Christ is given all who will accept the opportunity to escape the wrath of the Most High, which is sure to come.
he will also be the executioner when that time of the Gentile has come to an end. So he is worthy of praise as one who fights for us. But even he understands and understood that the praise doesn't belong to him solely. He understands that the praise belongs to the most high God in heaven. And when you go through Matthew's cha Matthew chapters five through chapter seven, um, there are a series of teachings. Um, the kingdom of heaven and politics, the sacredness of the commandments, almsgiving, sexual morality, truthfulness, and love, all in the effort to make them see and make us see that it isn't about pleasing the Father to gain salvation, but being an example of how pleasing the Most High is in efforts to invite others into salvation. He knew that in order for people to be free, he first had to endure becoming the pledge to break the curse. 